Hello, beautiful souls, and welcome back to this astrology, human design, and Jinkies channel with me, Tan. And today we're going to be moving on and continuing with our Jinky series, looking at Jinky 29 today. But before we get started, I'd just like to let you guys know that we have a variety of different services available there as well, and we'd love to be your guides on your self-discovery journeys. And yes, today we're going to be looking at Gene Key 29 or Human Design Key 29, which is the zodiac sign of Leo. So we usually start our episodes with a quick overview of each of these Gene Keys. So when it comes to Gene Key 29, this Gene Key spans a Leo Virgo cusp from 20, 30 degrees of Leo to 0, 0, 07 degrees of Virgo, but it's mostly Leo. It covers six degrees in the sign of leo and just barely one degrees in the sign of virgo so it definitely has more of a leo archetype to it the shadow of jinky 29 is half-heartedness the gift is commitment and the city is devotion leaping into the void the dream arc vision key bird is of course the cockatoo the life key animal is the pig and the fear key underworld creature is the python in the code on ring this jinky is part of the ring of union and is associated with the amino acid valine. In the 64 I Ching hexagram, this is water over water. So it's total 100% water, the abysmal. Plunge into the roaring rapids. The only danger of the abyss lies in our fear to cross it. Mm, I love it. The programming partner of this Gene Key is Gene Key 30, and that's Aquarius Energy. I just made a video on that. I highly recommend that you also check out the video for your programming partner because it offers a balancing, complementary energy to this archetype. In human design, Gate 29 is located in the sacral and is connected to Gate 46 in the G Center via a channel called the Channel of Discovery moving from the shadow of inhibition to the gift of discovery to the city of dance. Hmm, I'm already feeling excited just to talk about this dance gene key. But first, we're going to look at the animal that's associated with this, and specifically the birds in our videos. So that's going to be the cockatoo. Because these gene keys, they do represent an archetype in nature. And here we're bringing out the archetypes of birds when it comes to nature. So the cockatoo... The word cockatoo itself stems from the Malay word kakatawa, which means elder, brother, or sister. There are many symbolisms of the cockatoo from a symbol of alertness to joyousness, enthusiasm to spontaneity and bravery. So when we look at all of these words together, they, the cockatoo really represents what I would say positivity. Now, the cockatoo is also considered to be if not the loudest, then one of the loudest birds out there. Alongside the peacock and the bellbird, they're also really loud. So the cockatoo represents how you can express yourself to the fullest. This is a bird that is a symbol of devotedness. The cockatoo is very devoted to its spouse, its partner. It's a monogamous bird. And sometimes it gets depressed if the partners, if its partner dies. And even with humans, they are very attached to their humans. Humans, they have a big love for their owners. <laughs> they can kind of be attached to you at all times to the point where um, they don't want to stop touching you. <laughs> and so if you want to have a pet as a cockatoo, which, you know, I don't really feel like we should have birds as pets anyways. But if for some people out there, this, you know, to have this archetype somewhere in your life or to have this bird somewhere in your life, you really need to be committed to it if you want to make it happy, if you want to make it work. If you are somebody who has this archetype, maybe it's in your Gene Keys profile, maybe it's in your um, human design body graph, maybe it's just somewhere in your birth chart, in your astrological birth chart. So if you have some points or planets or anything there that is in the degrees that I mentioned previously of Leo, then you would have this archetype. This for me in my chart is my part of fortune. So this is like the, the archetype of how I draw good things into my life, really. It's my part of fortune, you know. Um, it's something that I need to like expand on. And the part of fortune is so interesting in astrology because it's, it's a combination of your sun, moon, and rising. And so for me, it falls here in Jinky 29. So that's really nice. It's in Leo, my third house. 
But yes, check to see if it has it's anywhere there out of your charts. If you have this archetype somewhere within you, of course, you're going to be somebody who is very devoted by nature. When you are committed to something, you really stick with something to it's the end of its cycle. Not forever. Notice how I said this till the end of its cycle. And because of that, you can really understand the true meaning of a commitment. And you're also somebody who is very brave because you will just dive right into something that feels right in your heart, in your body and go for it fully. And a lot of luck and a lot of fortune is bestowed upon you when you are able to dive right in and say yes to something that you feel is right for you. Now, we can also have the negative end of the spectrum with the traits of this archetype, which means that you are either too overly committed to something, you'll commit to something even though it has gone past its expiry date, or you are very reluctant to trust people and situations. So you can't really commit to things in your life and you don't really get the experience of what it's like to commit to something. So when we look at the shadow of half-heartedness when it comes to this archetype, this is the shadow of either overcommitment or a lack of commitment. And so I want to begin by giving you guys a diagram that I have made when it comes to my understanding of commitments. And this diagram that I have up here also incorporates its programming partner of this, of this gene key, which is gene key 30 there as well. So as you can see in my diagram, that this is a diagram of commitment, you can say. Commitment begins with desire. So I wrote sexual desire here, but sexuality and sexual desire encompasses many things. It's desire nature in general, it's creativity in general, it's the desire to reproduce anything, to make give life to something. So commitment always begins with desire for something. And this period of desire can last anywhere between like one day to maybe a year maybe two years but it's generally a pretty short cycle this desire nature within all of us so when the desire cycle has come to an end now we have to begin to to consider do we want to now commit to this thing that we have a desire for at the beginning or maybe it's not for us and we have to exit from this situation or this person and find a new desire. So we have a crossroads. But if we decide to go on and form an actual commitment to this person or this situation, this project, whatever it is, we enter into commitment. And commitment has a longer cycle. Commitment has about seven years cycle because that's the amount of time that it takes for the bodies and the cells in our bodies to kind of reprogram itself but depending on the person maybe it's just five years maybe it's seven maybe it's eight maybe it's nine but it should be somewhere around there approximately so when you get to a certain point in your commitment to something you get to another crossroads and this crossroad is when you have to decide whether you know you feel like this commitment has to end at the end of that, you know, seven year cycle, because you've learned everything that you needed to learn within this commitment. Or you feel like you would like to renew the energies or the lessons of this commitment after that's around seven years cycle, because it's really making you feel happy or um, we'll look a little bit further into why you might want to renew a commitment and why you might want it to end. So there's another crossroads decision that you have to make. And then once, if you do decide to end the commitment, then that's fine. And then you exit that commitment and you find a new desire. Or you continue to renew. So something has to be updated, upgraded within that commitment. And then it continues for the next seven years until you meet another crossroads and you have to decide if it's time to end or time to renew. And it goes on in this kind of cyclic nature. So that's the end of my explanation of my diagram, but it's important to consider this diagram when we're looking at um, this particular gene key. So with according to Richard Rudd, when you are on this cycle of commitment and you've really been able to follow through with a commitment to its towards the end of its cycle or throughout that cycle, you begin to get a lot of luck, a lot of good fortune comes your way. But the shadow of, of half-heartedness means that you are unable to trust the process here. 
So you don't allow yourself to participate in the mysteries of life here. Another way of looking at this can also mean that you don't actually trust that good fortune or luck will come your way. So you can't really commit to something. So when you're going through, so half-heartedness is when you are finishing that desire cycle, right? And you have to choose if you want to fully commit to this thing. When you have to make that decision to fully commit to something, the shadow of half-heartedness brings with it fear. And this is a fear and a worry and being concerned too much about where this path is going to lead you. What would be the outcome? What would be the consequences at the end of the destination of this commitment? You keep questioning whether it is going to be the right decision or not. And all of these worries and all of these concerns, they are within themselves the conditions that brings the misfortune into your life, into the commitments that you've made or half-heartedly made. To live half-heartedly means that you never fully embrace or trust the decisions that you make. And so you keep questioning, you keep getting worried, and you keep being concerned. So when you are in a repressed shadow of half-heartedness, this is also called over-committing. So over-commitment, if you look back at the diagram that I've made, it is when you have reached the end of a particular commitment cycle, when you have to decide, you, know, you have to make that decision, that crossroads, should I end this commitment? Because I've learned everything that I need to learn. There's no more growth. There's, it's not right for me anymore. Because we are always changing and evolving as human beings, right? We could make a commitment to do something right now. And then we've changed so much within seven years that well, this thing that we've committed to, it's just not right for us anymore. You know, we have to honor the fact that we grow and we evolve as human beings and that maybe we need to exit a particular commitment. So overcommitting is when the expiry date has done, has come. And instead of ending that commitment, you choose the other path, which is to renew the commitment when it's not really right for you anymore. And the reason why you may do this stems from a couple of different things. The first thing is the fear of societal expectations not being met and marriage and relationships are a really good example of over committing we just fear that if we were to get a divorce or if we were to break up that it would look bad for society and for the people around us so we just continue to be in a commitment that has passed its due date the other fear for ending a commitment when it should be ended is the fear to follow a new desire. It's like this fear to start something over again, to have to get in touch with the emotional nature of your desires. And please also check out my video on Jinky 30, which will explain everything about why desire can be very um, terrifying for a lot of people. And when you do this, when you are overcommitted to something, you can become exhausted by the magnitude of your commitments. It will cause you to become a slave to the person that you're committed to or the situations or the projects or the organizations that you're overly committing to. And you don't have the courage to follow a new desire or to be yourself and not have to and face you know face what society might think and face the expectations of society that are not met so there's a little bit of a lack of courage or bravery there the other more reactive version of this shadow and we always have two we don't have just have one repressive or reactive you'll have two of them they'll come back and forth within your life switching from time to time the reactive version of this is to be unreliable. So this is the um, more traditional version of half-heartedness here. So what this means is that, so if we go back to the diagram of the commitment cycle, you are not yet, so you'd have, so you fall through the desire, you've committed to something, um, but you, you didn't even reach that crossroads yet, you know, of you know, do I have to decide whether I'm going to end this commitment or I'm going to renew it? You haven't even learned the full lessons that are supposed to come with this commitment. You didn't experience this situation or this person in its totality yet, but you exit the commitment already. Um, and the reason for this is also a fear. There are many kind of kinds of fears that can come here. 
one of the fears may be here that fears of taking full responsibility for the promises or the expectations that has been negotiated or given at the beginning of a commitment that if you were to pursue with it and you were to continue for seven years or for 14 years that there's going to be a lot more responsibilities to uphold there there's also a fear here that you may never experience a new desire that you may not get your you know that feeling of that desire again and so you have to make sure that you exit before you get stuck in it for too long and you don't get to feel that desire again but that's not the case right we can have a commitment and we can also have a new desire on alongside we don't just have one path in our life and it, when you are in this kind of a um shadow you appear to other people as of course being unreliable almost like you can't follow through with a promise or with when you say when you have said yes to something so how can we work you know move this frequency transcend the frequency of half-heartedness into commitment what does it actually look like this beautiful cycle of commitment with this archetype and with this gate being located in the sacral which is the center of our life force our desire nature our sexual nature even this is the center that's in your belly so when you have come to that crossroads right and you have to decide whether you're going to end a commitment or whether you're going to renew a commitment how do you know which one it's going to be this is a feeling in your body that's going to tell you what does what's the right decision for you and this feeling in your body is felt in your sacral if you are now to make a decision whether you should end or should renew a commitment if that situation that person that project feels warm to you there's this sense of warmth in your stomach there's this sense this feeling of powerful warmth be a feeling of wholesomeness almost feeling like this is destiny nature itself has given you this destiny that is a feeling that this is the right commitment for you if it this commitment this situation this person's this project has been feeling or continues to feel and makes you feel nervous like you're going against your own destiny in some ways making you feel anxious making you feel not that warmth and not that wholesomeness within your belly and within your body then you know it is time to end the commitment so the warmth the power the destiny feeling the wholesomeness feeling is when you need to renew and continue that commitment the anxiety the nervousness the like it's not aligned with your destiny kind of feeling is how you know that you have to end that commitment and that the lessons have been learned and it's not the right path for you anymore and you will always learn something here's the thing about commitment as well even if even if you've entered into a commitment and you didn't wait until the end of the cycle right so you didn't even wait for seven years or so when you reach that crossroads and you have to choose which path you want to go on and you're in the the re reactive shadow which means you end it prematurely what happens is because you haven't fully learned the lessons that the universe wants you to learn from that commitment and you follow a new desire the same lessons will come back to you so let's say that you were you know with regards to your evolution and your growth the universe wants you to learn to love yourself right so to incorporate more self-love and self-care into a relationship that you have committed to but because you were in the reactive shadow of it you didn't even wait seven years you ended that relationship within one year after you entered into it you haven't really learned that lesson of self-love and self-care the universe wants you to learn so you exit that commitment you enter into a new desire a new relationship and the same lessons of self-love and self-care will present itself over and over again until the cycle is done until you have learned until your body has learned so that's how it operates Commitment is akin to trust, and it can never be forced nor willed. Only time will show where the river of each cycle of experience will lead. The goal is not what's important. The only thing that's important is that you follow through with a commitment or the journey of that commitment until its end, and you will evolve. You will learn something. You will grow. So the true definition of commitment here is not what society has kind of taught us to view commitment as 
it is really about saying yes to the things that feel right in your body, to things that feel that gives you that feeling of warmth, of powerful warmth, of wholesomeness, of destiny aligning. Saying yes to that. Yeah, it's yes. Yeah, it can be a little bit scary because there is no logic to it, right? You may have this good feeling in your body to something that you never thought you would feel. But yes, it's right for your body. But your mind says, "But I don't. I didn't think that this would happen. This doesn't make any sense to me." So you can choose to say no, or you can choose to say yes, and then have luck, have fortune, have good things coming to you when you follow through with that. And as you take on that decision, that may seem like a little bit scary for you. That's like you're falling into the abyss because you didn't doesn't make logical sense to you. Are you gonna quit? Because you doubt yourself, because you keep thinking about, well, what's the outcome? Well, this is strange to me because there's that doubt. Or are you going to just understand that you've already said yes? And when once you have said yes, there's only one thing left to do: be in it, one hundred and ten percent, all the time, with your whole heart and your whole body, and see how it turns out. And the interesting thing about relationships. Um, that begin with the right kind of commitments mean that a commitment where two people or three people, however people are in a relationship, they have entered into the relationship saying yes and understanding that anything can happen in this commitment. We don't have to overpromise. We can allow anything to happen because, but it feels right right now, and we're going to say yes right now. Then we allow for anything to happen. So this kind of pure, we can say pure commitment. Is what is going to lead to a breakup or an ending of that commitment that is also clean. It will not be nasty. It will not be filled with manipulation. It will not be filled with resentment. It will be a clean break as well.、Mm. Maybe you were thinking if a commitment begins with this pure type of commitment, then it would last forever. No, because that's the wrong idea of the success of a commitment. Remember, the true success of a commitment, whether. A commitment is successful or not is about how it began. Did it begin with that purity, and were you fully in it, and you enjoyed everything? Not enjoyed, but you fully learned. You learned the lessons in that commitment, and you followed through the cycles until it it ends. That is a successful commitment. The false, societal, outdated mindset of a successful commitment is that. You enter into it. You keep your promise, no matter what, and you try to make it last as long as you can. The longer you can make a commitment last, the more successful it is. That is the false understanding of commitment. When it comes to businesses, now a business is a journey that's filled with ups and downs. Your prosperity is directly linked to a clear commitment as well. Businesses may have many cycles. They may begin and end, and begin and end many times. And financial success cannot be measured by one single cycle, but it has to be measured by by the continued commitment and certainty in your decision making process. So, for example, maybe you started something in your business that just doesn't seem to bring in a lot of financial gains in the beginning, but the more that you just continue that cycle, that um. Service that process, whatever it is, new opportunities will begin to open themselves up for you, and then maybe you decide to move into that new opportunity, and then it brings you financial success and gain. But if you had stopped or quit when you within the first cycle, you just didn't get that financial success or gain yet, then you are not going to be able to receive or have those new opportunities that will bring financial success coming to you because you had ended it, you had ended that cycle. So that's kind of making sense there, and then all the magic, all the prosperity, all the abundance, all the luck, all the good fortune will come to you. I promise. So let's look at the city of devotion now, which is the city of this archetype. So, like I mentioned in all of my Jinkies videos, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the city because it's like the state of being where you're like enlightened and you don't really have to do anything anymore. It's kind of like when you have been in the gift frequency consistently, then the city will kind of dawn upon you. Richard Rudd describes the city of devotion as the path of bhakti yoga. 
And the bhakti yoga is the path of devotion. It's the path of the heart, where you completely lose your own sense of self in another. The other can be a mission, can be an ideal or a symbol or a cause. The path of devotion is far removed from society. Devotion is what Richard Rutz considers to be commitment gone mad. You fully leave the orders of your mind and enter into the wildness of your heart. You cannot help but become a devotee of a higher cause or maybe a guru. And you, the energy of love pours out towards that particular service. If this devotion is directed towards a mission, then that mission is everywhere in your life. It's in everything that you do. Everything that you do can be devoted to that mission. Interesting that we're talking about this right by my altar space here. This is where I do all of my devotional practices. This is where I build trust in myself for all of the decisions that I have made and that I have committed to. All the love that you have poured into your mission to, or your object of devotion will come right back at you and pours into all areas of yourself and of your life from everything in the universe. At this point, you have become what is called the beloved. Mm. You are literally seized by love and the aura of a person who is in the city of devotion is able to impact other people and turn them into devotees. It is near impossible to say no to such a person. And what is born out of this state of devotion is also called the path of Tantra. So I don't know if you guys have done Tantra. I love Tantra because it is the path of devotion. Whatever it is that you are devoted to, there's a lot of trust. You know, it, okay, if you're watching this video and you're like, I have trust issues, it's hard for me to trust people or to even trust myself. I highly recommend Tantra because when you do Tantra, you are going to be doing it with people, maybe one person or with a group of people that already trust you. They already love you. And there is no way that you cannot not trust them. When you are given so much trust and love from complete strangers, your heart just kind of melts and it just kind of opens up. And in that very moment, you feel the beloved that you are. And then you realize that you have so much trust and love and give to others, even if they're just strangers. This is the path of Tantra. This is the path of devotion. There's a transmutation of dense, sometimes sexual energy frequency into this pure divine energy. So the hexagram of the 29th gene key is the abysmal because it is really a symbol of living your life fully from your heart. And when you are in the city of devotion, or even sometimes just in the gift of commitment, you are contagious. Whatever it is that you are devoted to or commit to, over time, people will look at you and they'll be like, how is this person so committed and devoted to this? I want to get a piece of that. I want to follow along with them, with their journey, with whatever it is that they're committed or devoted to. Because if they can love that thing so much, then there must be some love in it that I want to get a piece of that love. So I want to end this transmission by reading a quote from the Gene Keys book that Richard Rudd has written. He says that the message of the 29th city is exactly this. Trust your heart above all else and never worry about the consequences. To be devoted means to lie forever in the lap of the divine. Ah, that's very touching. That's my transmission of Jinky 29 for you guys. I hope that you enjoyed this. And if you have this archetype somewhere in your chart, then do comment below and let us know what your experiences have been. If you like this video, then give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button if you haven't. If you already subscribed, then thank you very much for coming along on these Jinky's astrological human design journeys with me. I love you all so much, so dearly. And if you like my videos and you like my channel, then go ahead and give me a super thanks as well. A new feature that YouTube has brought to all of us so it's somewhere in the tabs below you can click around and you'll see that you're able to give a super thanks so i would really really appreciate that thank you in advance to anybody who is looking to give a super thanks and yeah if you're interested in getting a reading um human design astrology or gene keys from me or my sisters then please head over to my website tanastrology.com we would love to be your guides on your self-discovery journeys and i'll see you in the next gene keys video bye everyone sending you so much love